Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, If you would, go ahead and be turning in your scriptures to Mark chapter 4. If you're using your church Bible, page 998. Page 998, Mark chapter 4. And you know, if you've been with us uh, this summer, we are uh, studying a little bit of different episodes in the Gospels, looking at Peter's backstory. We, we got through Peter's first letter to the church, and now this summer we're highlighting some of the things that the Lord did in Peter's life to prepare him uh, to be a leader. Because ever since Jesus called Peter to leave the fishing business, And to follow him, there are certain things Jesus wanted to teach Peter and to teach the rest of the disciples in order to prepare them to become leaders of the early church. Jesus kept pulling the curtain back just a little bit more, revealing a little bit more of himself to those men. And in our scripture this morning, The Lord has some specific things he wants to teach Peter about himself, but also he wants to teach Peter how to be better prepared for the storms of life. And you know we all need that lesson. Because all of you are aware that living in this area, we certainly uh, experience our share of, of bad storms. We think about Hurricane Ivan and Katrina, and Michael, and others like that. But it seems like the more we go along, the more and more we get more information about how to be better prepared for those those storms. But you know, sometimes the worst storms that we face don't involve the weather. Sometimes the worst storms we face involve the personal storms that show up unexpected in our life. And maybe some of you are in the middle of one of those storms right now. And if not, maybe there's one waiting on the horizon for you. And during those storms like that, those times of crisis, sometimes we ask questions like, Why did this happen to me? And and where is God in all this? And doesn't God care? And this morning in our scripture, we're going to see from Mark chapter 4 that Peter and the other disciples started asking those same questions. Now we believe Mark in his gospel got most of his information from Peter himself. And as we read through this very familiar scripture this morning, it's going to become obvious that Mark had an eyewitness account of what took place on the Sea of Galilee that evening. And so with that in mind, Mark chapter 4, our reading picks up in verse 35. Mark says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were uh, with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. 
And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And the grass withers and the flower fades, but this is the word of our God that stands forever. Would you pray with me again, please? Father, I thank you for your word and how it speaks so much to us. Because all of us in here this morning, Father, are aware that Storms can come up into our life very unexpectedly. Times of crisis, times of questions, times of doubt and worry and fear. So, Father, as your people, we pray that your spirit who inspired John Mark to write these words so many years ago, that that same spirit will make these words and these truths very real to us teach us we pray and give us ears to hear we ask in Jesus name amen first thing we want to look at this morning is the setting we're going to see three different movements in this short passage we're going to see the setting then we're going to see the storm itself and then finally the solution that Jesus offers the setting, Mark says, if you look back uh, earlier in uh, chapter 4, Jesus has been teaching all day. He's been teaching the crowds, and Peter and the other disciples are right there close by, taking it all in. And Mark said most of his teaching earlier in that day was in parables. And do you remember Jesus' custom was, when he taught in parables, he would then take the disciples aside and communicate to them the meaning of those parables. Because some of them, as you know, were very difficult to understand. And now it's the end of the day. Jesus is done teaching. And he tells the disciples there in verse 35, let us go across to the other side. That's what he told them. Let's go across to the other side. You see, Jesus has a divine appointment waiting for him on the shore, on the other side of the lake. And so he has the disciples get into the boat. And that boat that has become such a familiar part of Jesus' early ministry. As they get in the boat and they head out across the Sea of Galilee... And the storm comes up. You understand that they weren't in that storm because of foolish choices. They were in that storm because they obeyed what Jesus told them to do. Notice after leaving the crowds, Mark says, they took him along just as he was in the boat. That's significant. The implication is he is exhausted. Jesus had been teaching all day, and he is worn out. Now, a lot of you probably know that feeling. You work all day, and the end of the day, you're just ready to quit. Maybe by the middle of the day, you're just ready to quit. Give me some air conditioning. Give me my chair or my bed. I'm just tired. During summer camp, uh, the Lord impresses upon Jan and I the importance of <laughs> uh, how old we're getting. Because uh, for most days during summer camp, we're getting there about 7 in the morning. Uh, a lot of times we don't get home until between 9 and 10 in the evening. And these days have been hot. And God continues to remind me the middle of the day, Bill, you 
you're getting too old for this. Uh, you, need to, you need to rest. After walking around, my golf cart helps out a lot. But walking around a lot, my feet get tired, and uh, I'm ready to get home. It's past my bedtime. I'm ready to get home at night. The Bible says, Jesus, as he goes and gets ready to go into the boat, he was give up. He was exhausted, teaching all day long. So that's the setting. And now, let's consider the storm that comes up beginning in verse 37. Notice Mark says, a great windstorm came up. As I understand it, this is like a, a hurricane force wind almost. The way the Sea of Galilee sits low in between the mountains, I understand that storms like this can come up uh, without notice. And you can get caught off guard with this, where these winds will, will turn just the regular waves into some very dangerous waves. And so, Mark says, as this, as this storm comes up, waves begin breaking over the side of the boat, and the boat begins filling up. Historians tell us that a typical fishing boat would have been about 27 feet long. So it's not a very big boat. Maybe some of you have been in a boat when a storm came up all of a sudden. You got caught off guard. And you, maybe you, in that moment, panicked. You weren't prepared for that. That's what happened to these men. These disciples in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And remember, some of these guys are fishermen. They've been on the water all their life. They've seen storms come and go, but yet they were not prepared for a storm like this. What did the disciples do? The same thing most of us would have done. They began to panic. They thought they were doomed. They, they began seeking some relief. Perhaps they started bailing water. Now, there were other boats around, but those other boats or in the same storm that they were in, so they would be no help. They were in need of a miracle. But you know, that's not what they were looking for. You know what they were looking for? They were looking to write their own, uh, their last will and testament. They thought, this was it. We're going under, boys. It was good to know you. They thought the whole program was getting ready to be at the bottom of the sea. You know, sometimes we see God work in the lives of others. We see God show up in a big way, but then it's our turn in the storm, and we panic. And we ask, where's God in all this? Where's God when I when I need him the most. That's what the disciples wanted to know. Where is Jesus at? They had seen him do the miraculous for others. They had seen him cure other people. Peter saw him cure his own mother-in-law. They had seen how he had rescued those who were being oppressed by demons. But now it's personal. Now it's me that's in the middle of trouble. Does that ever happen to you? Man, you see what God's done for other people. In fact, maybe you've gone alongside them and tried to encourage them, sharing scripture with them, praying for them. As they experience their own storms. But then it hits home. And we panic. The disciples begin to panic. Where's Jesus at? And Mark says they find him, notice, asleep on the cushion. Remember, he's exhausted. The storm hasn't bothered him. 
Now this might be conjecture, but I wonder if they had like a committee meeting to decide who was going to be the one to go wake him up. <laughs> I don't want to be that one. Whoever draws the short, the short straw gets to go wake him up. And so one of the disciples has that honor. And he goes over and he comes quietly to Jesus and he reaches over and touches him on the shoulder. Uh, Sorry to trouble you, Jesus. Sorry to trouble you. But some of the other guys, they're getting a little antsy about this storm. Now I'm cool with it. But they're getting a little antsy. And so I was nominated to come and tell you. You think that's how it went down? I don't think so. I think they went to Jesus in sheer panic, shaking him. Jesus, wake up. Do something. We don't have a whole lot of time left. They assumed the boat was going under. And so they woke him up. Why? To calm the storm? No, no, no. They woke him up to voice their protest. Jesus, help us. Don't you care? Get a bucket. Do something, Jesus. Don't you care? What a terrible question that was to ask Jesus. Jesus could have responded, don't I care? That's why I left heaven, to come down here to this earth, because I care. That's why I'm in this boat with you, because I care. And so... They feel like Jesus doesn't care. We're seeing the setting. We're seeing the storm itself. Now let's look at the solution. Verse 39. We begin with Jesus' reaction when they woke him up. He stands up. He doesn't rebuke them. The temptation may have been there. He doesn't rebuke them. Instead... We read he begins to rebuke the wind and the sea. And notice he says to the waves, quiet, be still. Literally, the words are, be muzzled and stay that way. Mark uses one Greek word to describe Jesus' command here. And it can be translated, hush! (laughs) I hope I didn't rouse the storm. (laughs) And when Jesus said that, Mark says, the storm stopped. And Mark speaks in the aorist tense to say it was instant calmness. It wasn't like we see storms kind of gradually get back and away. No, no, no. Instantly. Calmness. The sea becomes like glass. And in verse 40, Jesus then speaks to the disciples. What was their problem? Jesus says, a lot of fear and a lack of faith. In other words, Jesus says, look, why couldn't you just trust me? Didn't you hear me say, let's get in the boat and go to the other side? Why couldn't you just trust me with that? There was no reason to fear because I was in the boat with you. Notice the disciples' reaction. Verse 41. Steve asked me about this this morning. It says they were terrified. They were scared before. 
because of the storm. Now they're terrified. Not because of the storm, but because of what just happened. And Jesus calming the storm. You see, Jesus had calmed the sea, but he stirred up a storm in the hearts of those men. How could they have been better prepared? Maybe a better question is this. How can you and I be better prepared when the storms show up on our doorstep? And to answer that, let's consider some of the lessons that Jesus had for Peter and the rest. Two of them we want to look at this morning as we close out. Lesson number one. As a child of God, expect the storms because they will come. And you know Peter learned that lesson? Let me read to you from his writing at the end of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter writes to the church, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter says, expect them to come because they will come. Not just bad weather. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about times of crisis. Remember, he's writing his letter, 1 Peter, to those in the church who are undergoing persecution under the hands of Emperor Nero. And Peter says, God allows those rough times in order to shine his glory uh, into our life. Peter says, because of that, those storms, those trials don't need to catch us off guard. If you're walking with the Lord, you should expect them because they, they will come. And some of you know that all too well because you've been through the fire. You felt the heat of those flames. You felt the pain and the heartache. And if you haven't been there, don't let your guard down. Because it's not if they come, it's when they come. Be prepared. That was lesson number one. Expect the trials. Expect the storms. Lesson number two for Peter and for the disciples and for us. Realize who it is with you in the storm and what he wants to teach you in the middle of that storm. The first reaction of Peter and the rest of the disciples, verse 41, who then is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. You see, we need to have a better understanding of who Jesus is. Not just a good man, not just a good teacher, Someone who helped out a lot of people. He's the God man. He is God in the flesh. Lord and master. Even over the storms. And so once again. Jesus pulls that curtain back a little bit. Gives the disciples a little more re revelation about who he is. And you know when I think about it. I don't know of any other passage of scripture that more clearly teaches both the human side of Jesus and the deity side of Jesus. As a human, he was worn out, exhausted, just like we get. Sleeping through the storm. But yet, as the God-man, he was able to speak to the wind and the waves and they obey him. We need to get a better grasp of who it is with us in the boat. Who it is with us in the storms that come our way. One of the best ways to do that is to invest time in the scriptures. And let God continue to reveal more and more 
of himself to us. There are many lessons he had for Peter. And one of them in that boat that night was this. How much he cares. How much he cares. Because that's what they asked him. Don't you care? Did you notice it wasn't the storm that woke Jesus up? When our kids were little, I was amazed sometimes at how Jan could sleep through the storms. It'd be rumbling all over. Lightning flashes everywhere. And she'd be out. And I'd be up and she'd be out. But then our kids would cry out in the middle of the night. You know what would wake her up? That would. They would be crying out and she'd be up like that. I had a little trouble with my leg this week, but back in those days, my elbow is what gave me the most trouble. I kept saying, Jan, the babies are crying. <laughs> <laughs> you know what our kids used to love to do? Uh, when they'd cry out to us at night. They would love to come and get in bed with us. They would love to lay their head on our pillow. The wonderful picture that we're given of our Savior in Mark chapter 4 is this. What woke Jesus up? The cries of the disciples. Jesus said, I know you're going through a storm, but you don't have to panic. You don't have to fear. And I believe the beautiful lesson he wanted to communicate to Peter and to us is this. During those times, he wants us right up on that cushion with him. It's a big pillow. He wants us resting with him. And I want to remind you that Peter finally got it. Because even though he asked the question on that boat in the middle of that storm, Jesus, don't you care? He writes later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. As a child of God, expect the storms. They will come. You may be right in the middle of one round. You may have just come from one. There may be one on the horizon. And when they come, and they will come, and when they come, remember who it is with you. The God-man. The one who invites us to cast all our cares on him because he deeply, deeply cares for us. Let him speak peace into your life this week through his word. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we pray for grace in our lives because sometimes when we see others going through storms, we try to bring comfort and encouragement. And yet when the storms end up at our household, we confess that sometimes we panic and we worry and we fret. Father, help us to find our rest in you. Help us to cast those cares on you because you care so much for us. Not just care for us. You're able to take care of the worst of storms. So Father, I pray that for all of our families represented here this morning, Father, you will, through your word, speak peace into our lives. Help us to trust you when things don't go right. Help us to trust you when things seem to fall apart. 
Just give us grace to endure the storm, reminding us that you're right there with us. And you love us and care for us. Thank you for that truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.